Hey, Tiger, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Doing very well. I'm excited for this conversation with you today. Um, I've been following you for some time on social media. And unfortunately, I have not had the opportunity to read any of your books, mainly because my TBR is insane. But they're always there on my mind. I think I need to read Tiger's books. I'm, I, I would love to dive into them. I love epic fantasies. Uh, before we get started with the conversation, how long have you been in the publishing business or how long have you been writing? So it's been, uh, it's been a little over 10 years at this point now okay. from when I, when I first started writing. Um, I think it took me the first book, it took me a couple of years to get it actually fully written and published kind of not really sure what the heck I was doing. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I've, I've been in the game now for a little over 10 years. That's impressive. I, I think I, like it feels to me that I have been in it for 10 years, <laughs> but I have not. It's just, it's a, it's a lot of work in a positive way. Did you self-publish your books or do you, are you traditionally published? So everything is self-published now. So when I started um, back with my first book, I initially started, I actually started as a blog because blogging was really big in, mm. in the time frame, And I was like, I'll just, I, I want to write this thing. I'm going to do it one blog entry at a time and I'll get rich off a blog. Like that was the the dream that time. And so I started it and people started liking it. But then I was like, wow, I actually, I might have something here. Like maybe I should do something, like put a little bit more thought and effort into this rather than just running it as a blog. And so I started looking at publishers and everything. And I made such a huge mistake of getting pulled into the trap of a vanity slash hybrid publisher mm, mm -hmm. and, and it was it was a disaster uh, the company ended up going out of business lawsuits all of that I ended up getting the rights back to my book and then I don't know if you were in the publishing game at the time but Macmillan had come out with a sort of self-publish through Macmillan online it's sort of like, uh, kind of like how Drafted Digital set up, but it was through Macmillan. It was one of their subsidiaries. Sure. So you could have the Macmillan name as the publisher, but you could independently manage all of it. And that was really cool. But after like a year, they closed their doors. So I had um, to get, I had to get all my work back again. And I said, if I'm going to have to continue to republish stuff, I might as well just do it myself anyways. <laughs> And so, yeah, the first couple of years, it was back and forth messing around with that and looking at small presses. And then I just said, you know what, I'll just take care of it myself. And uh, I've been doing that ever since. I mean, I think that's amazing that you recognize that for you, it was the right move to publish it for yourself, expecting that there might be the possibility of having to redo it anyway. I think there's a lot of people listening that are on the fence between traditionally and self-publishing. And I think there's positives to both of them. I think, you know, we could have a, long, a lengthy discussion about who, which one I think might be better for me, but I can't answer the question of what might be better for whoever might be listening. So it's just cool to hear your story, kind of where you've come from. Um, those vanity publishers, they almost got me. They did. Um, but I, I, you got to learn at some point. And some people learn before and some after. So, yeah, well, they got, they got me for a little while, but it, at least I learned from it. I think that's the key. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Learning from anything is important. I, I'd love to talk a little bit more about your fantasy, the fantasy that you write, because you, you've said a couple things that are very fascinating to me. Um, you've mentioned things like faith-based fantasy and or fa uh, fantasy that edifies. So I'd love to pick your brain a little bit on, on what that means to you and why are you so passionate about writing this type of fantasy for readers? Yeah, yeah. So um, when I when I first started writing, I didn't know what I was going to write. I just knew that I wanted to write fantasy that, you know, would edify or inspire the person who picks it up. Now, that person may not be a Christian like I am. They, they might not be a follower of Christ, and that's perfectly fine. But I still want them to be able to come away afterwards if they pick up one of my books and they read it yes there's going to be action there's going to be magic there's going to be battles there's going to be treachery and intrigue and all these fun things 
that are staples in this type of fiction that we enjoy. But I, I want something in there that's going to, an undergirding that's going to build them up and that they walk away, that they're going to be able to take something away from that story that's just going to edify them, that's going to build them up or maybe even inspire them. And so the hope is, is just a really big theme throughout all my books. Um, there's a lot of great grim dark out there in, in today's you know fantasy landscape. And I've read some of it. I, I've enjoyed a little bit of it. But I, I want to offer literature or, or fiction, I should say, that is that counterpoint, that, that that's that contrast, which really, if we look at, you know, fiction going all the way back to like Tolkien and, and C.S. Lewis, that really hope was a benchmark in epic fantasy if you really go back far enough. So that's just kind of my thing. I want something that can be uplifting, that can be encouraging to the person and maybe even thought provoking. I think, first off, I think it's really amazing that you knew, I mean, you didn't know right at the beginning. I like how you mentioned that you didn't quite know what you wanted to write. I was totally in the same boat. But that you landed on something that not only felt comfortable to you, but you, I guess, gave you purpose in writing. There's a lot of people that, you know, say the business is in something like the nonfiction or, you know, say romance or, you know, there's these bigger markets for for book selling and money out there. But as the author, we one, have the choice, you know, we have that creative control. And two, um, we we get to do that because of how the market has been created, the, the allowances of indie publishing and whatnot. And so would you say that your books were kind of intended for family audiences? Or like, do they, I don't know if they're meant for younger audiences. Is it the type of fantasy that can be read by anybody of any age? So that's a really good question. And this is a, a question that I struggled with a lot when people would ask me this initially, because my, my books are, a lot of them, especially the earlier books, are really fast-paced. There's a lot of action, a lot of battles, a lot of fight scenes, and sometimes they're a little graphic, right? There's definitely a lot of violence throughout it. When you have sure. war, that's, that's what happens, right? And so I don't shy away from that. So I was always a little um, uncomfortable telling people, yeah, your 10-year-old can read this, right? And then my kids were younger than that. And I'm like, there's no way I'm letting my eight-year-old read this at this mm. point there. They're not ready for it. But what I learned as I continued to write and my kids started getting a little bit older, I realized that my my one of my boys, he's 11, he's able to read my entire Demon Hunters trilogy right now, even with them battling demons and all of the horrors of battle. <clears throat> he's totally fine with it. My daughter at that age, she probably wouldn't have been able to handle it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm their maturity is so different and, and how they handle different things, um, what they're comfortable with. So what I've done is I, I've tried to keep that in mind that although I was writing more of like a, a, a loader and Narnia kind of geared towards adults, but trying to make it accessible for for a younger audience as well. So while there's battles, it's not gonna be a bunch of vulgar language. It's not gonna be steamy and compromising scenes. And if there is stuff, it's gonna be implied and it's gonna take place largely off, off camera, if you will. That way it's accessible um, to, to that younger audience. Well, I, I think it's it's hard to define the audience, like you said, because some parents and some kids are going to be a little bit more sensitive to certain things. But um, I think focusing on, for me, kind of the adventure aspect, like you said, the hope aspect, the edifying aspect of that hopefully proves to parents and listeners that, hey, these are, you know, clean. Maybe let's use that term. I know people don't love that, but for all intents and purposes, you know, lack of spice and potentially um, foul language but I, I want to kind of take take a step back to the edifying because um you know a lot of people listening may be religious a lot of them may not be but i think everyone can recognize certain content elicits different feelings emotions thoughts on us regardless of the medium and we recognize hey this is something that i am interested in so in this case, we're talking about edifying. So how can you, how have you ensured that the books you're writing 
are edifying? What elements do you infuse in them to ensure that they, the readers are being edified as they read it? It's a fantastic question. So, you know, everything that I do is going to really play out through the character's journey, right? So in, in some of the stories I write, some of them, there's a very large cast of characters. And as difficult as that can be to write when you're talking 150 or 200,000 word book, what it does, it gives you a whole lot of room to play with different character developments. And every character has different problems, different challenges, different weak, weaknesses, different strengths. And so during those character arcs, as you're, you're developing that story for that character, as part of this much larger tapestry, you really get to explore the failures and the successes and lessons learned through that. And so I really try to dig into those opportunities, whether that person is continuously blowing it and screwing up, there's always an opportunity maybe to learn from that, or if that person is handling situations well, and really trying to bring grace and, and love and truth into situations, even when they're tough situations or perilous situations, even if people are dying, right? Trying to trying to bring a, an, another way to look at situations. And that's really what I try to do a lot is regardless of what a particular character is going through, is there another way we can look at this scenario through the, the eyes of that character or maybe the characters that they're interacting with? And just, just kind of those little lessons sprinkled throughout to kind of just challenge us to have a different perspective at the way we would look at certain things. I think that's an interesting point that you mentioned. I, I, so I've learned recently that I, I read books with amazing characters. Um, and when, when a book falls short of that, then I, I struggle, but I think, you know, it's a re a very realistic way even if characters maybe are very different from the people that are reading them, right, our readers, there's always elements of that character that they can relate to. And so as they're going through those journeys, as they're experiencing those edifying situations and those um, kind of expanses of thought and learnings, the readers are brought along and they can experience a similar thing. I think that's really amazing. It's something that probably most authors don't think about right? Um, because maybe that's not what they're going for. Maybe they are going for something spicy. Maybe they are going for, you know, very gritty, very dark, and they're not seeking that edification. That's okay. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. But I think it's amazing that you've been able to identify kind of what you were hoping for and place it within the arcs of those characters. So I just have to know, are you a plotter or are you a discovery writer or pantser? I'm just curious. So what what is it? Planter? <laughs> a planter. Middle, yeah. So I, I think that's I great. Try to, I try to plan it out. Like I'll I'll do from a very high level. I don't I don't write paragraphs and paragraphs, but I'll go through with a book or a series and I'll make a bullet point type of outline. And okay. I'll hey, here's here's where we're gonna start. This is where we need to finish, and these handful of things need to happen somewhere in between. And after I do that, I essentially pretty much deviate from the whole thing. So, <laughs> so that's, and this happens every time. It doesn't matter whether I'm talking about a chapter or an entire book. Um, that's pretty much what happens. But the weird thing about it is that's just part of my creative process I've learned over the years, because if I don't do that, even minimal level of outlining, it's, I just struggle. So yeah, I don't know. How about yourself? Uh, I mean, we sound very similar, although you are a tad, probably leaned a slight bit more towards the plotting. I wouldn't even call that very heavily plotting. That's mostly panting. It's very similar to me. The difference is I don't write anything down. I, <laughs> I think, you know, I'm like, well, I think this is where I want to start. And then this is probably where I want to end. Like maybe there's these couple scenes in the middle and I, I don't write any of it down. I just write. Um, I not, I'm not advising that to anybody, but I'm, I'm definitely a, a pretty heavy plotter or excuse me, pantser, uh, discovery writer. Um, so I, for this, obviously everybody writes differently. Everyone has different experiences with the process and how they get to the finished product, so to speak. But I'm curious to know, as you, as, have you ever been in a point where you're writing a series or a book that you want to be edifying and then you go through the editing phase and realize, oh, this isn't, this isn't right. Like, have you ever had to do significant redrafts to make it more edifying or have you found that it's just there as you're writing it? Well, so for full disclosure, I, you know, I talked about my 11 year old reading 
one of my series, my, my Demon Hunters trilogy. And uh, he, full disclosure, he called me out. He's like, dad, this is not appropriate. Dad, mm. why did I use this word? And I'm like, these are, these are bad people doing bad things. And you're worried because they said like almost what we would consider like a, a church swear or a pew oh, swear. Uh-huh. Sure. Like, they're not even like super vulgar, but he's like, dad, that's just not appropriate. That shouldn't be in here. And I'm like, so I'm, I'm, I've gone through and I've, I've looked at it. I, I've reevaluated it. Like, is there a, is there a way to get the statement across and use a different word? Maybe it means the same thing, but use it in a different way or, or deal with that. So I've, I've had that. Um, and I definitely, I have had instances where some of my alpha and beta readers who I really trust, they're like, you know what, this, this scene is, you can do better. You, you can get mm. your point and I've, I've, you have to trust people in those situations though. Right. And so I definitely have over the years and I will say, I don't, I don't know what your process looks like, but having alpha or beta readers that you can really trust like that to, to call you out on stuff that that's like so precious to have that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a type of feedback that I think a lot of authors don't think about, you know, maybe you're writing a story and you think, oh, this is going to be good and I'll just send it to the editor or I'll just edit it right away. But external feedback, that objective feedback is extremely critical. And, you know, you were humble enough to, to say, oh, okay, yeah, I see what you mean. Maybe that's not what I'm looking for. It's not in, in line with what I was hoping to accomplish. So you can make those changes. Now, the, the tricky thing is, I will say this with beta reader and alpha reader um, feedback, sometimes you do need to take it with a grain of salt, not in reference to whether or not something's appropriate, but more X, something was not interesting or or unnecessary. So it is, it's a positive and a challenge at the same time to receive lots of feedback. <laughs> It is. Like, hmm, I need to I need to really consider that. But it's great that you have that support network, right? And and they know what you're going for, and they can say, "Hey, Tiger, this is uncharacteristic of you," uh, and and what you're hoping to accomplish. So, um, it, it, we've talked a little bit about edit, edifying fantasy, and you've mentioned kind of faith building and whatnot. I, I don't these are these considered Christian fantasy books or. Are they like? Are there elements of Christian beliefs and whatnot throughout the stories, or are they set in completely um, non-real settings with with like maybe different sets of religion? So, uh, great question, and I've, I've tried to answer this over the years. So, there's definitely these are all secondary worlds, right? Mm-hmm. So, it's not portal fantasy or urban or anything like that. So, these are sure. all their own created worlds. Within those worlds, there are many different religions, usually, and many different um, supernatural entities, if you will, right? Demons, devils, maybe, uh, you know, whatever, mythical creatures, all of that. But the, the faith elements that I have written throughout definitely reflect my Christian faith. So you do see that it's maybe dressed up, maybe called something different, or, you know, maybe it's inferred or whatever, but yeah, you see a little bit of everything. So um, I'm trying to think like in my Demon Hunters trilogy. So there's, there's like an entire pantheon in that world. And that pantheon are all of these different deities that make up this pantheon. And all of them are like patron gods that have certain specific attributes and different people groups all over the world worship different deities. So there's, there's all kinds of different variety throughout these worlds and these books, lots of different belief systems and people groups and stuff like that. Okay. And I I was just curious because I know that there is um, a Christian fantasy category. Um, I I wasn't sure if that's what you were targeting or, you know, know, it's kind of like the, the ideals and kind of just the, the clean, positive edifying perspective of, of Christianity and that religion. So the reason I was asking, I was curious to know if you've, if you've experienced any challenges in finding the right audience or received potential um, negativity based on your decision to write what you write. Absolutely. Um, so when I when I first started writing, that was the direction that I was going is that it would be labeled Christian fantasy. 
And there was a lot of, I, I don't want to say it was like overwhelming, like cancel culture or anything like that, but there was definitely a, a lot of negativity from people who looked at the cover. They never actually opened the book. They looked mm. at the cover, they looked at the blurb and said, uh, you must be a Satanist because there's a dragon on your cover. And, and I got, I got a lot mm. of stuff. Like that. So, um, and it, be one thing if they actually read through the book and then there was dialogue, but there was a lot of, you know, criticism and judgment. And a lot of times it was people that didn't even, didn't even read the book or anything. So definitely it was a lot of challenges there. Um, and quite frankly, I, I didn't want my, I didn't want my books to be limited, even though I'm not writing books that maybe are going to uh, provide the spice and, and the other things that maybe some readers are looking for. I didn't want to limit my books to just such a narrow audience. Mm -hmm. And so I, I wanted my books. To, I didn't want the labels. I just wanted my books to get out there. And if people liked them, they would refer them to other people. And regardless of, you know, the, the label, if that makes sense. And so then I kind of went back and forth of whether that label's there at all or not, because within a lot of the fantasy communities, whether it's why I'm sure you see this in YA as well, where if it has a Christian label, there's a lot of people who won't ever even give it a chance. Yeah, that's true. So there's just a lot of assumptions that are made. Um, but I mean, I have, I have readers and fans that I've had for years from all different walks of life that are able to enjoy the books, even if they're not, we don't share the same belief system, if that makes sense. Right. Um, and there's a place for everyone and there's there's readers for everyone, but sometimes it's hard to find the right readers. And if you misclassify your books, um, either intentionally or unintentionally, it can be hard to find those readers um, and, and have an audience. Because like you said, there's there's interest in everything. There's People are going to be interested in that spice. They're going to be interested in the horror. I, I don't read horror. <laughs> I've never really been interested in it, but I know there's a fairly big audience for that okay that's great but but the authors it's important to know hey this is the audience that i'm going for even if you don't know at the beginning of the book like as you're writing it that's okay you can identify it later but just make sure it's been identified so that you can market to the right people um and you're not unintentionally drawing in negative reviews because people think your book's something that that it's not i understand nope. negative reviews if they don't enjoy your story or for whatever they do read that genre but you don't want to be targeting the wrong people just uh, that's the challenge with it um so the question another question that i have is around um, reaching that audience. So what have you done to try to find the audience for your edifying? Do you, do you use terms such as faith building, edifying fantasy in your marketing to your audiences? It, it depends. It kind of depends on the audience that you're marketing to at that time too, right? So the, the buzzwords that you use, you're going to, you're going to adjust that, that language based on who you're targeting at that time, where you're sharing that. Um, if, if I'm over in a large community that's like largely secular, I'm probably not going to say faith-based fantasy sure, or faith -based yeah. fantasy, but I will use words like inspire, edify, encourage, hope, because those are, those are very broad things that everybody can understand that those are good things and that we need those things and that we want those things. Like everybody's able to understand that without a prejudice in the way, right? Uh, but if I'm in a different audience talking about faith fuel, their faith-based fantasy, that, that language is more welcomed. So it's not trying to be deceptive or anything like that, but just understanding the right language for the audience. And so that's kind of my thought there. Um, but you know, one of the things that we've also seen in the emerging subgenre, and I think you've seen some of this on TikTok, and I, I know you had interviewed um, Jack Adkins a while back as well, mm -hmm. but the the noble bright genre or subgenre is kind of finally starting to maybe get some legs a little bit, and that subgenre is not one of the nice things about it is it's not even specifically Christian based fantasy. But it's it's more of this fantasy that's fueled by hope and that decisions matter and making good choices or doing the right thing isn't foolish and naive, where you, your choices actually matter and it's it's good to be honorable and, and noble. And so 
as this genre has kind of started to gain a little bit of recognition in the community of readers and authors, a lot of us have not only tried to really help prop up the awareness of the, the Noble Bright fantasy genre, but we created the Noble Bright Alliance, a, a Discord community for either authors, artists, or readers that are interested in that type of fiction, whether they create it or they consume it or both. So that's one of the things that we've tried to do. There's a number of different Facebook groups and stuff just to try to get awareness out there that there is fantasy, even if it's not Christian per se, but there's this more uplifting, encouraging, hopeful type of fantasy. And that doesn't mean it's happily ever after either. That's a misconception. It, it, these books can be dark. They can be tragic. They can be heartbreaking. But there's still an undercurrent that hope is, is existing and that there's, there's morality matters. And, and so we've tried to really help myself and many other authors. We've tried to help spread awareness through some of these different initiatives through social media and stuff like that. <clears throat> That's, I, I'm pausing to reflect because I know, <laughs> I think it's amazing that you, you already mentioned a lot of different um, places to engage with not only readers, but other authors. And and you talked about the Noble Bright Alliance, which I actually had just recently joined. I, I uh, But how, how does someone sift through all of those resources, right? You've mentioned Facebook groups, you've mentioned Discord groups and whatnot. Um, for someone like myself, and I know many of the listeners are also in the spot where they just have so much responsibility in a positive way, right? They're an adult. They've got things, possibly they're teenagers. They've got school, college, and whatnot. And they don't have a lot of time to engage with everything. Yeah. So how do how can someone know when the Discord group or the Facebook group or or the, the, whatever they've joined to try to help them with their objectives is the right thing? How do they know what, what to say no to, if that makes sense? No, it does make sense. And it's, it's really good because like you, I'm a dad and I've got young kids. I've got tons of responsibilities and I try to eke out time just to do the writing as it is. Right. Mm -hmm. And so many people that are super busy in today's world. So I totally get that. You got to find what really fits for you and fits within your schedule. I like discord because I essentially, even though I don't own discord, it's, it's my server that I started if I don't like stuff that's going on within the server, I can control it, but it's also, there's not algorithms manipulating what is seen and what mm. isn't. We can control all that myself and the mod team, and we can, we can have those discussions. It's not Facebook's playground. Now, sure. there's a lot of people who are, they just, there's a, maybe a little bit of a learning curve with Discord, some people feel. I, to me, I don't see that, but some people, they're just, Facebook, they're already accustomed to it. So they just prefer that platform. So my thing is which, whichever one you feel more comfortable with, or if there's, there's some Noble Bright websites that are starting to pop up where they're having scoring systems where you can kind of go through and some of those are in their infancy, but there's some there that you can find maybe your next read based on a scoring system. And you can look at those scores based on what's important to you. How do they, how do they determine what are clean reads for them? Right. So there's a few different resources, but just finding out what works for you. I think from an author perspective, I think the most important thing is that for us authors, if we're passionate about this, how do we network with other authors? If we feel that this, that the world needs more of this fiction that can edify and inspire people, how do we work together to, edify each other how do how do we work together to help support each other like you're doing this podcast right how do, how do we network with each other to help get how do i get your fiction in front of my readers eyes because the chances are if they like mine they're probably going to like yours and mm -hmm. vice versa so that's really like that type of partnership is really what we've tried to build within the noble bright alliance but it shouldn't be limited just to a discord server 
Right. I think that's interesting, kind of creating the author community. Um, uh, I think a lot of people look at authors as a competition, which, you know, in part, I mean, it's, I will be honest, you're, you're competing for your reader's attention. Not everyone has all the time in the world to read books. And so you have to help them decide which book to pick up. And hopefully it's yours. But at the same time, you know, we, we shouldn't be focused on that. We should be focused on the, like you said, you, this book is like this book, or hey, if you like this, then you'll probably like this. And it, it's just so challenging. In the world where there's not a clear rating system for books um doing like for like is the best indicator for um for readers you know there's no pg ratings pg 13 r rating so it's hard for them to know the content of books unless we aid them through our marketing and community efforts so fascinating there's a lot of there's a lot that we could dive into there but uh, we are running short on time. Um, before before we end here, I love to ask, where can people find more information about your books, possibly your Discord server if they want to join it? Um, what, where can they find more information about you? Yeah, uh, so the easiest place is just going to be right through my website. So just www.tigerhebert.com. Um, you can read a little bit about the, the two different book series that I have going on right now, as well as keeping pace with uh, my current work in progress. Uh, you know, I have blogs up there that I put up every now and then, sometimes book reviews and, and other stuff like that. But you can also, if you sign up for my uh, my newsletter, you'll get a couple different books for free through that process. And that's where I send out all my updates, maybe once or twice a month at most. And uh, just to follow along with that is, as well as, you know, any updates and stuff like that. Um, as far as all my books, you can um, find those, of course, on Amazon. And the Discord server, it is the Discord Alliance. There's also a link for that on my website. And uh, I can I can provide the, the link because Discord links are funny. They're all weird yeah. different and stuff. They're yeah, weird. <clears throat> but okay, perfect. We'll make sure to put that in the show notes. Well, thanks so much for your time. This has been excellent. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it.